Uh, as Dominic mentioned, the topic of this talk is InkerDOM. And this is a framework for writing web UIs that we uh, designed at Jane Street a few years ago. And it's what we've been using to write a lot of our internal web UIs. So the first half of this talk, I'm going to go over some of the background of the framework, uh, as, well as, some of, as well as some of the main concepts behind it. And then in the second half, we'll do a demo to see how to actually write a simple InkerDOM app. So let's start with some background. As many of you know, uh, Jane Street is a trading firm. So a lot of our coding effort goes into writing trading-related software. Uh, and as a result, we don't have as many resources or as much time to focus on web development. At the same time, we very frequently find ourselves with large amounts of data that we want to display to the user in a nice way and that we want users to be able to interact with and modify. So it turns out we want to write web UIs quite frequently. So here's an example of a typical Jane Street UI. Uh, this is uh, an example that's actually available uh, in the InkerDOM examples directory, so you can all access it after the talk if you're curious. Um, so this is a mock-up of a trading system GUI, and I wouldn't worry about any of the trading terminology in here. Basically, all you should care about is that this is a table with a few columns and lots and lots of rows. So there are 10,000 rows, to be exact. Um, and you'll notice that the data in this table is changing fairly frequently. So this doesn't seem like a really exciting UI, but there are several things that you can do here. So for instance, you have this focus that you can move around and notice that it always stays scrolled into view. Uh, you can also edit certain cells. So let's double the edge of EMIK. Um, also, you can, you can filter on the first column. So here are all the symbols that contain substring ABC, for instance, or AB. Uh, and also, you can sort on any of the columns. So let's say I sort on last fill. This is what it looks like. So um, this is a great illustration of how frequently everything is changing in this app. Um, there's updates. Uh, tens of times per second. And also you'll notice that the actual order of the rows changes as the content of the column we're sorting on changes. So there are several pretty tricky things about making this app efficient. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned before, we just are dealing with a really large amount of data and very frequent updates. Uh, so just that fact makes it really hard to get this to be efficient. Also, there's some uh, more subtle things that cause this to be tricky. For instance, when we're sorting the rows, every time uh, the content that we're sorting on changes, we have to recompute the order of the rows. And same idea with filtering. Every time the content of the column we're filtering on changes, again, we have to figure out which columns, which rows rather, we want to keep and which ones we want to throw out. So one technique that we use uh, to make rendering somewhat more efficient is partial rendering. So I'm going to dig into the HTML to find our table. And here it is. Can you all see that more or less? Um, OK. So I claim there were 10,000 rows. However, here we only see 10 or 20. So one trick we use is partial rendering, where basically we only actually render the rows that are in view at the moment. So if I scroll down slowly, you'll see that new rows get added to the bottom, and old rows get removed from the top. So this is one trick that is not really part of Inker DOM proper, but that's a common technique that we use uh, to make our apps more efficient. And I'll talk about some other things that are part of Inker DOM uh, proper as well. So hopefully this gives you an idea uh, of the types of, UI, of UIs that we deal with at Jane Street. So we wanted to put together a framework that would make our lives easier in several ways. First of all, we wanted it to be really easy to be able to write these web UIs, and for it not to require uh, learning all the ins and outs of web development or having to learn JavaScript, we hoped it would be approximately just as easy as writing an ordinary OCaml app. Also, we wanted to be able to write really easily maintainable apps. So uh, the hope was that once a developer uh, put in some work into adding a UI to an existing tool or system that they had, uh, that after that they could kind of set aside the UI 
and not really have to worry about anymore and count on it continuing to work even as uh, various things in the back end changed. And lastly, and very importantly, we wanted to be able to optimize our UIs. As you saw in the previous example, we often deal with really large amounts of data, very frequent updates, so it's really important that we can get our apps to still be responsive and uh, still update smoothly. Um, so we looked at uh, a lot of existing web UI frameworks out there, and two of the ones that we got a lot of ideas for, uh, for Inkerdom, uh, are React and Elm. So React is a JavaScript library, uh, written by Facebook, and it's fairly pos popular nowadays. Uh, that's made especially for, for writing interactive UIs. And Elm is a, a language that was designed specifically for writing UIs. Uh, it was designed as part of uh, a senior thesis at Harvard, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's a functional language. It is quite similar to OCaml, in fact. So I'm going to talk about the actual ideas that we got from each of these libraries in the next few slides. But the takeaway here is that Inkerdom was heavily inspired by a lot of existing ideas. So the first concept uh, behind Inkerdom that I'd like to talk about is JS of OCaml. And this is a compiler from OCaml bytecode into JavaScript. Uh, so it's, it's very powerful. It can compile pretty much the entire OCaml language. And it allows you to run pure OCaml code uh, within a web browser, which is pretty cool. So you could imagine writing a whole uh, OCaml top level that's run purely in the browser. So this was great for us because it meant we could write our web UIs in OCaml. And this has several benefits. First of all, a lot of our backend is already in OCaml, so it was very convenient to be able to write our client code in the same language because it meant we could share a lot of code between the two. And this is great for maintainability uh, because often if something changes in the back end, uh, if that change is made to shared code, it'll automatically uh, apply to the client code as well. And if not, maybe it'll break some things. You'll get some compile errors, but those are still a lot easier to deal with and to fix than trying to maintain your web UIs in a completely separate code base. Uh, another uh, benefit is that we have been working for years to build up tools and libraries to make it easier for us to program in OCaml. So um, it was really beneficial that we are able to use these libraries and tools when we're writing our UIs. So it's nice that instead of having to re-implement something in JavaScript that we already had in OCaml, we can instead just compile it into JavaScript using JS of OCaml. Oh, sorry. And uh, lastly, we have a lot of OCaml knowledge at Jane Street. Um, all of our developers are extremely comfortable and familiar with it. So this meant that there was that onboarding would be just a lot easier for new users of this framework. Um, and in fact, we, we have a lot of reasons why we really like OCaml and why we've chosen to use it within Jane Street. So all of those benefits could now apply to our web UI writing as well. Uh, things like type safety and the expressiveness of the language. Um, all right, so right now we know what language we want to write our UIs in, but we still have no idea of the, what the actual code should look like. So this is where the Elm architecture comes in. Uh, this is a design pattern that you can use when writing UIs, and it's commonly talked about within the Elm community. It was first noticed because it frequently just naturally emerged in a lot of Elm programs. And if you're familiar with the model view controller pattern, this is pretty much the same idea, except that we have um, a bit more spe specific information about what that controller bit should look like. So uh, here's the actual pattern. Uh, we have three main pieces that we need to be concerned with. We have a model, which is the state of our app at any given point in time. We have the view, which is a way of displaying our app to the user. And for instance, we can do this using HTML. And we have some actions, which are the ways in which we can update our model. Uh, so every time you have a new model, you call this view function to produce your new view for it. And you can imagine in your HTML that you have some event handlers 
that handle things like users clicking on buttons or typing in text. And so the way those event handlers should handle the events is by scheduling actions. And once you have some actions scheduled, you eventually apply them to your model uh, using this apply action function. All right, so we can think of Inkerdom as a first approximation as an implementation of this LM architecture. And it provides several benefits. It's a very nice pattern. Uh, one benefit is this fact that we've clearly separated out the logic of our program into distinct parts that deal with different tasks. So we have uh, a function that generates our HTML for us. Uh, we manage the state of our app completely separately from that. And we have a very clear way to update the state. Another benefit is that this uses the declarative paradigm. And the idea here is that uh, you're able to express your model, sorry, rather your view, as an all-at-once computation. So instead of having to figure out the series of steps that you need to make to your old view to update it into your new view, you can just specify what you want your new view to look like in the end. And you don't have to worry about figuring out the differences. So now that we know that Inkerdom is more or less an implementation of this LM architecture, uh, we can form an idea of what an app interface should look like. So to be clear, this is not the interface of the Inkerdom library. Instead, this is the interface of an app that is managed by Inkerdom. So basically, the user has to implement an app with all of these components. And then Inkerdom will take care of wiring everything together and managing the state and everything else that needs to be done. So let's take a look at the pieces that the user has to provide for their app. Uh, first of all, there's this, there are two types, uh, a model.t and an action.t. And these correspond exactly to the two, two components out of the three that we saw in the Elm architecture. Um, so the user can specify any types that they want for their model and for their action. Notice they don't get to specify the type for the view because that's already decided for them. It has to be HTML. And next, the user has to provide two functions, the apply action function and the view function. And if you recall from the previous slide, there is also a schedule action function. This is provided by Inkerdom itself, so the user doesn't have to implement this. So the apply action basically takes a model and an action, applies the action to the model, and returns a new model. Then the view function takes in a model and the schedule action function, which allows you to schedule new actions from within your event handlers, and it produces an HTML DOM. So if you're not familiar with what a DOM is, it stands for Document Object Model. It's approximately a mutable tree that represents the state of your page. It's very closely related to your page's HTML, and it is very closely linked to the browser. So it directly determines what the browser displays, and that means that every time you make a change to the DOM, that results in browser work. So things like recomputing CSS, figuring out the new layout, and actually repainting everything. All right, so now we have an idea of what our app should look like. We have an interface that we have to basically implement. Um, however, there is a problem with this, which is that every single time we have a new model, we have to completely uh, recompute our DOM. And as I mentioned, any changes you make to the DOM are extremely expensive because they result in browser work. So this ends up just not being feasible. So to fix this, we bring in virtual DOM. And virtual DOM is a technique uh, that you can use to avoid making excessive changes to your DOM so that you reduce the amount of work that's caused for the browser. And this is uh, a very popular idea that appears in a lot of frameworks. In fact, both Elm and React use it. And I think React is the framework that has popularized it, but it existed before React. So the idea here is that you store uh, a virtual copy of your DOM. So you just store a copy of your DOM in memory as a lightweight object where it's not at all connected to the browser. So if you ever make changes to it, it's just as cheap as any changes you'd make to an ordinary uh, JavaScript object. So unlike making changes to the DOM, it doesn't result in any work for the browser. And so it's much cheaper to update it. 
So here's the idea. Um, let's say that my DOM right now has three nodes, uh, A, B, and C. And we see that on the right of this diagram. And let's say that we have this virtual copy, this virtual DOM of the current state of our DOM, which is labeled old virtual DOM at the top left. So now, let's say I want to change my DOM to actually have four nodes, A, B, C, and D. And recall we want to use a declarative paradigm where we just all at once specify what we want uh, our new DOM to look like. So I create a completely new virtual DOM from scratch that has the nodes A, B, C, D. So then the first step of the diff and patch algorithm is diffing. So we diff the old virtual DOM against the new virtual DOM, and we produce a patch that contains exactly the difference between them. So in this case, the difference is just this additional child node G. Next, we apply only the patch to the HTML DOM. And so this ends up being a much cheaper modification to our actual DOM than if we had completely recreated our DOM from scratch. So the benefits of this are, first of all, um, it is a more efficient way to update our DOM. And second of all, it allows us to use this declarative paradigm of specifying what we want our view to look like all at once, which would not be feasible to do if we were doing that directly to our actual DOM. All right, so now I wanted to show you uh, the API of our virtual DOM library, because you, we will need this when we're actually uh, filling in our view function in the demo. So there's two main types an attribute and a node. And to create an attribute, you need to specify a name and a value. And to create a node, you need to specify a tag, a list of attributes, and a list of children, which are themselves nodes. So this uh, ends up being a tree, more or less. And each of these two types also has some utility functions just to make the syntax more concise. So I just wanted to show you that this uh, Syntax corresponds very closely to actual HTML. So let's compare some sample HTML to the corresponding virtual DOM. So note that every time we have an HTML tag, we call this node.create function and pass that tag in as the first argument, just as a string. Then if our tag has any um, attributes associated with it, we pass those in as a second argument. For instance, you can see that uh, on the third and fourth line for our div tag. And finally, we pass in whatever children are associated with that tag as the last argument. So we can see this for body, it has two children. And we can make this slightly more concise using the utility functions I mentioned. So for instance, there is a, a function called body that's you know, a bit more concise than having to call create and pass in body as a tag. All right, so now that we have this idea of a virtual DOM, we can use it in our app. So instead of our view function returning a new DOM each time our model changes, it can return a new virtual DOM each time our model changes. And this is nice, so now we've solved the problem of um, avoiding all this extra work in our browser that's very expensive, but it turns out that even just creating a new virtual DOM node every time our model changes is also expensive enough that the apps we get are just not as efficient as we'd like. So to fix this problem, we bring in incremental. And incremental is an OCaml library that deals with self-adjusting computations. So what that means is that it allows us to build a complex computation that depends on some set of inputs in such a way that when some of our inputs change, we're able to update our computation uh, in an efficient way. And in practice, the way this is done is we build up a graph where uh, all of our inputs are nodes in the graph. And for any given node in our graph, its value is a function of the values of its parents. So what this means is that if an input node changes, we know that its descendants are exactly the nodes that need to be recomputed. Um, so, you know, first we recompute all of his children, then his children's children, and so on. And as an additional optimization, we also have this idea of cutoffs, where basically if you recompute the value of a node and find that the new value is equal to the old value, uh, we know that we don't actually need to recompute all of his children. So this saves a lot of extra work. All right. So the way incremental is used in Inkerdom 
is to more efficiently convert our model into our virtual DOM. So, for instance, if only a small part of our model changes, we can then only recompute the small part of our virtual DOM that corresponds to that, instead of having to completely recompute our full virtual DOM. So, now I want to show you some incremental syntax so that we'll be able to use it in our demo. So, there is this type, alpha t, that basically represents an incremental computation whose value is of type alpha. Uh, another way to look at it is type alpha t represents a node in our incremental graph uh, where the value of that node is of type alpha. So we could have a type int t, which represents the type of a node with an integer value, for instance. All right, so now we have two functions that allow us to build up our incremental uh, graph, assuming that we already have our input nodes. So uh, the map function basically allows us to add one single new node to our graph that has a single parent. So as arguments to the function, we provide the parent node, as well as a function from the parent's value to the child's value. And so the map function creates this new child node for us and returns it. Uh, map2 is exactly the same idea, but it creates a node with two parents instead of one. So we pass both parents in as arguments to our map2 function and a function to get from the parent's values to the child value, and it creates and returns this child value for us. So now I want to show you this let syntax, which is a syntax extension. Um, it doesn't change the semantics of anything, it's just syntactic sugar, um, but I'll be using it and it's very convenient, so I wanted to show it to you. Uh, so let's look at the inker.map function. Uh, if you'll recall, it takes two arguments. One of them is an incremental node, and the other one is a function from that incremental node's value to a new value. So if we look at the let syntax that corresponds to this, we first start off with let percent %map, and then we have this a variable that is not incremental, it's constant. And then on the other side of the equal sign, we have an a underscore i variable that is incremental. So the variable on the right side of the equal sign corresponds to the first argument we pass to inker.map, and the non-incremental value on the left side of the equal sign corresponds to the first argument that our function f takes. So it's a little bit confusing, but once you get used to it, it's very nice, because if you ignore all the percent maps in your code, it looks like an ordinary non-incremental program. Yep? So this is just a ppx that goes from back to that. Exactly, yeah. Um, so if we want to do this for map2, notice we still just use the keyword map instead of map2. And we also have this additional keyword and that we use to separate the two incrementals. And we can extend this to three incrementals or four or whatever number. So we could write out the equivalent of what would be, you know, map3, map4, map5 using let syntax. Okay, so let's look at an example now. Uh, let's say we start off with three nodes uh, that are int incrementals. And we want to add the four nodes below them to our incremental graph. So we want a min node that just takes the minimum of the three, we want a max node that takes a maximum of the three, and we want two nodes, min view and max view, that uh, create very simple virtual DOM nodes that just display those values. So this is what the code would look like. Um, to create our min node, we have to map over all of the incrementals that it depends on. So because it depends on A, B, and C, those are the incrementals we map on. And once we have their values, we apply some sort of minimum function to them. Um, we have a very similar idea with creating our max node, but we apply some sort of max function instead of a min function. And then to create our last two nodes, the min view and max view, they each have one dependency, so we map on the single node that they each depend on. So for min view, uh, we map uh, on the min node, and then we create a simple text uh, virtual DOM node that just displays that value as a string. All right, so now let's put this into a bit more of an inker DOM context. So let's say that 
uh, we're looking at our view function, which, if you'll recall, takes in uh, an incremental model. Or rather, the last time we looked at it, it was just a constant model. But now let's imagine we can take in an incremental model. So let's say that these three um, int incrementals that we started off with in the previous slide are actually obtained by projecting them out of our model. And furthermore, let's say that once we have our min view and our max view nodes, we kind of stick them together into a body node uh, to get uh, a virtual DOM node that we can actually return from our view function. So one thing to note here is that because everything is projected out of our input node, which is our model, um, if we didn't have cutoffs, then that would mean everything would get recomputed every single time our model changed because everything is a descendant of our model. And this is generally true for all Inker DOM apps. Um, in your view function, all of the nodes are descendants of your model. So this is where cutoffs become really important. Uh, if you'll recall, a cutoff is uh, this extra check if uh, a node's value hasn't changed after an input has updated, you know that you don't need to recompute its children. So here, for instance, let's say we had uh, some fourth variable d in our model that we don't end up using in this graph. If that, if that value changed, our model would change. So we'd have to recompute our a, b, and c nodes. However, then we'd find that our a, b, and c values haven't actually changed. So we'd avoid having to do the rest of the work of recomputing the rest of the graph. All right, so here's what the code looks like for this. Uh, so we're looking at our view function. And I've simplified it to take a single argument in, which is a model incremental. So to create our three uh, incrementals, a, b, and c, uh, for each of them, we have to map over their, their single dependency, which is the model. And then let's say we have some functions, get a, get b, and get c, to extract our respective ints out of the model. Then once we have these, we're back to the situation we had in the previous slide. So we would reuse the same code we had there to construct the middle part of our graph. And once we have our min view and max view nodes, we would map over both of them and put them into a virtual DOM body node to get our final view node that we would return from our view function. All right. Now, I wanted to mention a very useful library that's built on top of incremental called IncreMap. And this allows you to efficiently work with incremental maps. And to be clear, here by map, I mean uh, a key value store structured as a tree. Uh, so let's look at an ordinary map function that I've called convert. And what this does, um, if any of you are familiar with OCaml, the actual name of this function is map i, but I've changed it to avoid confusion with the many meanings of map. So this takes in a map uh, as an input, as well as a function to uh, basically transform all of its data into new values. And it gives you back a new map with all of the values transformed using that function. So if we look at the, the equivalent incremap map function, you'll notice that it has pretty much the same signature, except that it takes a map incremental instead of a constant map and returns a map incremental. Uh, and this does a very similar thing to what we've been seeing in our view function. Uh, basically, it avoids doing unnecessary work when our input map changes. So uh, we have these uh, functional maps, and we have an efficient diffing algorithm over them. So we're able to, every time our input map changes, we're able to only do work proportional to the size of the diff to update our output map instead of having to reconstruct the whole map. And uh, this library is extremely useful in Inker DOM whenever you want to uh, display something that you'd normally use a list to do, such as um, cells in a row or rows in a table. So if we add this idea of incremental to our app interface, which we've already kind of done, uh, our view can now take an incremental model as an input and return an incremental virtual DOM as an output. So this saves uh, a lot of work and you now no longer need to completely recompute your virtual DOM every time your model changes. All right, so now we have an interface that allows us to actually build reasonably efficient uh, web UIs. So let's look at a demo. All right, so this is what we'll start with. It's a very plain looking app. Basically, 
it just has this one heading with the text my Inker DOM app. So we'll be building on top of this to make it a bit more interesting. Um, so let's take a look at the code that was used to create this. Uh, there are three main files that you should be concerned with. The first one is Dune, which con contains all the instructions that are, the build system needs to know how to build your, your app. So you need to specify things like the OCaml uh, module that you actually want to compile into an executable, which is main in our case. Also, any dependencies that our code have. So we depend on the Inker DOM library here. Um, also, this JS of OCaml line you need to include for uh, any executables that you want to be compiled into JavaScript, as well as any libraries that those executables depend on. And finally, we specify any preprocessors uh, that we require. Don't worry too much about what that means if you're not familiar with preprocessors. But for instance, uh, PPXJane is required in order to use the let syntax that we saw for incremental. All right, so the next file that we need is just this very ordinary looking HTML file. And you'll notice the body is left empty. That's because Inker DOM will be generating the body for us. Also, it's important to include the JavaScript file that's going to be compiled by JS of OCaml as a script uh, in the head. And we can also include some additional stuff if we want. Here I have a style sheet. All right, and now I guess we have this, this CSS here, just very basic styling of our tables. And the main thing that contains the bulk of our code is this uh, OCaml file main.ml. So the first thing we do in this file is to uh, implement an app module that has the interface that you've been seeing on all of the slides. And additionally, we also provide an initial model just to specify you know, what the initial value of our model should be when we start up our app. So let's take a look at this. First, we have our type model.t, which I've set to be equal to unit. This is like void in other languages. It just means that we have pretty much nothing going on in this model type. So it's just like an empty model. Um, we also have to specify this cutoff. This has to do with incremental cutoffs. We just have to specify an equality function. So phys equal is physical equality. You could also define your own equality function. And this is for comparing models, to be clear. Um, next, we have our type action.t. And again, we've set this to unit. Yep. Oh, sorry, what's the type of cutoff? Oh, sorry, cutoff is, uh, it takes two models and returns a Boolean. OK. OK, action. Um, yeah, we've set action to unit two. So basically, we can't really do anything in our app right now. Um, and we have this slightly confusing syntax. Basically, this sex of uh, generates a way to serialize our actions so that we can log them in our browser console. And the function should log allows us to specify which actions we want to log and which ones we don't. So here, we're logging everything. Next, we have this state module. And this might be a little bit confusing, because I had previously claimed that the model already represented the state of our app. So the idea here is that we want our model to be immutable. And we need that to be true, mostly, uh, in order for everything to work as expected in Inker DOM. So if we have any imperative states, such as connections to servers, things like that, they should go in the state instead of the model. All right, so next we provide an initial model. The type of our model is just unit, so we provide a unit. Um, we have our apply action in view functions. Apply action takes in a very boring action that can't do anything and a model. So we just return our model unchanged for now because the action wouldn't be changing it anyways. And we have this view function that takes an incremental model. Now, I've chosen to map on my model at the very top of this function. So you'll note that the, the model variable on the left of my equal sign is actually a constant value, whereas on the right, it's an incremental value. Sorry, you can look at the bottom to see that. Uh, so what this means is that uh, Below line 38, we can treat our model as a constant. We don't have to worry about any incremental stuff. But it also means that all the code below that line gets recomputed every single time our model changes. 
So this is a simple way to not have to worry about incremental if you're writing a very simple app. But if you're worried about performance, this is just an absolutely terrible thing to do. So we're going to leave it for now, and we're going to come back to it later. Uh, and I create a very simple virtual DOM node, a body with some text in it. Next, we have these three functions that I'm going to skip over. So note that you have to implement these, and we've included the trivial implementations here. But you have to include them in order to satisfy the Inker DOM app uh, interface. And they are useful when you uh, start writing more complicated apps. But for our case, we just don't need them. So now that we have our uh, app module defined, all we have to do is pass it to Inker DOM along with the initial model we want to use. And we do this by passing it to this function startapp.simple. And Inker DOM takes care of everything else for us. So just to make sure that we're actually running the right code, I'm going to make a small change to this and see if that gets picked up in the browser. So to compile this, uh, we can use Dune, which is a build system for OCaml. And we just use this build command and specify what we want to be built. So of course, we want our JavaScript file, which is very important. I've also included uh, the HTML and the CSS so that they'll all end up in the same build directory so that we can access them all in the same place. OK, so this has successfully compiled. Uh, now let's look at our browser. Oh, sorry. All right, so if I refresh this, we now see my first Inker DOM app. OK, next, let's make our app slightly more interesting. So let's add an actual model to it. Let's say we want to keep track of a list of counters. And I'll represent, use, uh, I'll represent this using uh, an int list. Next, uh, I should actually provide an initial model that's a list and not a unit. Um, and I'll randomly generate this with length 100. So all of the elements of this list will randomly have values between 0 and 99. And lastly, I want to actually display my model uh, instead of just ignoring it. Uh, just a note, the underscore before model tells the compiler that we are intentionally not using this variable. Otherwise, the compiler would complain to us. So now I do want to use it. And I'm going to create some row nodes. So this uh, list.mapi function basically goes over all of the elements in our list along with their indices. So let's see. Here we have our index and our actual counter value. And I'm going to create a row node with no attributes and with two children that are both cells. So the first one will also have no attributes, and we'll just display the index. So node.txt. It's like node.tr and node.td are different corresponding tables. Yeah, so these correspond perfectly to HTML. So if you're familiar with the tr tag, that's what's used for rows, and the td tag is used for cells. Um, OK, so I'm going to add one to the index, just so that it starts at uh, 1 instead of 0. And the second cell will also have no attributes, and will display the counter value instead of the index. And lastly, we actually need to add this to our main uh, virtual DOM node that we're returning. And I'm going to put it in a table. All right, so if I recompile this, and refresh the page. Now we see uh, a table with two columns, where the first column is just the indices, and the second column is the randomly generated counter values. And we have some kind of nice styling here. We have a border and alternating row colors. This was all done in the CSS file I showed you before. All right, so next, let's add a bit of color to this. Uh, I'm going to um, color each of the counter values uh, based on the actual value. So let's say if our count is smaller than 10, we'll make it green. Otherwise, if it's smaller than 100, 
we'll make it blue, and otherwise we'll make it red. So it'll start looking a bit scarier as the numbers get bigger. Um, and we'll add, okay, so we'll add this color to our second cell in the row by adding an attribute. Um, and there's this nice style function that takes a list of string pairs, and my list is only going to contain one element, uh, where the property name is color, and the value is the color that I computed above. So now that we can uh, compute styles and things like that using ordinary OCaml, and they can also be dynamic, they can change as a function of uh, various other values in our virtual DOM nodes. So if I compile this and refresh, now we see the colors we expect. So smaller numbers are green, larger numbers are blue. We have no red because everything's under 100, but that's fine. Okay, so now let's add some actions. Uh, I'm going to use a variant here. If you're not familiar with variants, they basically express the idea that um, our actions will take one of several forms. So let's say we can have uh, an increment action where we specify which index we want to increment and also a reset action where we also have to specify the index. Okay, so now that we have more interesting actions, let's not ignore them, let's apply them properly to our model. So I'm going to introduce a, a little helper function here that will update a single index in our list. So we pass it the index and the function to use to update it. Okay, so we'll map over our list and if we are at the target index, then we'll apply the function f to the counter value. So if i dx equals i, then we apply the function, and otherwise we just leave the value unchanged. Okay, now to actually handle our action, the way you need to usually handle variance is through pattern matching. So a match statement looks something like this. If our action is an increment action, then we update our index by adding one to the current value. Otherwise, if it's a reset action, then we update our index by ignoring the current value and just setting it to zero. All right, so now we have these actions we are properly handling them if they're ever scheduled, but we're not actually scheduling anything. So let's add some scheduling to our event handlers. Now, if you'll recall, I claimed that we'd have an argument called schedule here, and instead we have this inject argument. Um, inject is pretty much the same as schedule, except its type has been slightly modified to force you to necessarily use it within the event handlers of your virtual DOM nodes. But otherwise, it's identical to schedule. So let's schedule some, uh, sorry, let's add some event handlers uh, to our rows. So let's say if the user clicks once on a row, that increments the counter. So we inject an action dot increment and we specify the row based on which row was clicked on. Okay. Now, let's do something similar with double-clicking and resetting. So, if the user double-clicks, then we inject a reset function instead. Okay, and just to make things a little bit more interesting, let's also regularly schedule uh, some randomly generated increment actions just to keep things ticking. So we can do this in the onStart function, which I previously skipped over. This is a function that's called once at the very beginning of, you know, initially running your app. So first, let's get our model length. And let's use that to randomly generate uh, increment actions. So... So here we'll schedule uh, something about 20 times a second. Oh, this should actually be every. And so we'll call the schedule function and pass it 
a randomly generated action. So action.increment, the index will be a random number from 0 to the length of the list minus 1. All right, hopefully this compiles. And let's see what that looks like in our browser. So, okay, so now you see that uh, some of the counters are incrementing on their own. And also, if I click on a counter, it'll increment by one. And if I double click, it goes to zero. And now we'll see some things have started turning red finally. So, yeah. This works pretty well. It's pretty smooth. Um, if I click or double click on a counter, it updates pretty quickly. Uh, let's see what happens if we make our list of counters much longer. So the first thing is that I'm going to do is I'm going to add uh, a length argument to our initial model. So Now I'm going to change the implementation of that accordingly, if I can find it. All right, so now we actually pass in the length that we want. Uh, okay, so I'm going to copy this chunk of code that I don't want to uh, type out from scratch. Basically, this uh, looks at the query string of your URL and tries to parse uh, the number of rows that you want out of it. And it looks for the parameter rows. So if it doesn't find this, it just defaults to 100, which we have down here. And once we have this length, we actually need to pass it to our initial model. All right, so let's try this. Uh, if I set rows to 10, this indeed works. So now let's just set this to a really, really big number. Um, and I happen to know that 30,000 is the number we want so that we start seeing everything break down, basically. Okay, so you saw that took a few seconds to load. And now that it's loaded, if I try to scroll through, it's extremely choppy. Ooh. Scrolling up for some reason. Um, and also, if I try to reset a counter, you'll notice quite a big lag before it actually updates. So let's go back and fix this. Now, as is some of this because of the constant crawling of this data structure, or is it all just because of the, or it's all just because of, of, of inherently happening in this? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? Well, some, some of what you're doing there is using the data structure that you're yeah. going through repeatedly. You know, there one could you know, use a raise or what have you, would that oh, make a difference there, or...? Um, that might make a difference, but another thing that will make a difference is using incremental more effectively. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so, in fact, I am going to change the list, but not to an array. I'm going to change it to a map. And the reason for this is that once we are dealing with maps instead of lists, we can use that nice incremap library that I mentioned before. So, let's make... Oh, sorry. So let's make this a map, and also we have to specify the type of our keys. Let's make our keys integers that are just the indices of the elements. Okay, so now everything breaks. Um, as a preliminary attempt to fix this, I'm just going to change all calls from the list module to corresponding calls from the map module. That turns out to work quite well. So I'm going to replace list with map. All right. Okay, so that fixed a lot of things. Clearly didn't fix anything. It didn't fix everything. Um, so for one thing, to initialize my map, I actually want to create an association list first. So I still want to use list. And I also want to now pass the index um, and use the index in the list I create. And once I have this, I can pass it to uh, a function in map that creates a map out of an association list. So of a list exception. So now we create our map. Some other issues are even though uh, map functions very closely correspond to list functions, some of them have some additional labels. So I'm going to add those labels. This happens in two places. And we have one last problem which is that this rows variable 
is now a map, but we actually need a list to pass into our node.table function. So I'm, I just want the data in our map, and I can get that using this map.data function. All right, so let's test that this compiles. Looks like it does. However, note that we haven't actually improved the efficiency of anything because we're not actually using our Inker map library yet. So let's go in and do that. So if you'll recall, uh, what I did initially here at line 46 is I mapped on my model at the very top of my function. And this was nice because now I had this constant model value I could use. If we look at uh, the bottom here, we can see it's just a model.t. And so that was you know, easy to deal with, but it's extremely inefficient because we are recomputing this whole chunk of code every single time, even like the smallest thing changes in our model, which we've set to be at least 20 times a second. So let's just remove this line. It's a terrible line to have in there. And now we have an incremental model. Oh, that was not what I hoped for. Uh, yeah, so we have a model.t incur.t. And if you'll recall, our model is a map, so that means we have a map.t incur.t. And that's great because it means we can now use our incur map library. So all I need to do is use the uh, map i function from our incur map library instead of the plain map function, and everything almost works. There's still an issue, which is now that our rows is an incremental value. And we need a constant value to actually build our virtual DOM. So I'm just going to map on our rows instead. So if I recompute this, and, oh sorry, recompile it rather, and refresh. Uh, notice that the page is still very low, very slow to load. Uh, recall that incremental helps with, you know, handling incremental changes. It doesn't help with the initial work. But now that it's loaded, uh, I can, well, hopefully I can scroll, sorry, one second. So I can scroll a lot more smoothly. And also, if I click or double click on a counter, it updates much more quickly. Um, so just one last thing that I want to add to this demo to show you the power of the Inker map library is I want to keep track of the total over all of my counters. So I'm going to add this total variable and I'm going to compute it using uh, another function in Inker map called unordered fold. So what this does is you give it a starting value and a way to update that value for every element in your map, and it gives you the total accumulated value after going through all of your elements. So I want my starting value to be zero because this is a sum, and I need to specify two functions. One of them is um, what to do if we have a new entry in our map, and the other one is what to do if we remove an entry from our map. So I don't care about the key, so I'll just ignore it. But every time we have a new entry, I want to add its data to our sum. And similarly, every time we remove an entry, I want to remove its data from our sum by subtracting it. So sum minus data. Okay, and now let's actually use our total somewhere in our virtual DOM. And if we refresh, we hopefully now have, okay, so now we see this total at the top of our page. And I guess it's hard to tell if it's actually computing the right value just from this example, but <laughs> one thing to note is um, it doesn't make our program any more laggy. So if I click or double click on something, it updates very efficiently still, and I can still scroll, well, more smoothly, yeah, I can still scroll fairly smoothly. Um, so, actually, if we want to convince ourselves that this is doing reasonable things, we can just uh, take a look at a much smaller number of rows, let's say 10, and here, for instance, if I reset everything to zero, we can see the total going down in a reasonable way. All right, so that was the demo. Uh, 
Um, let me close that. All right. So basically, we saw how to write this very simple Inker DOM app. Now, if we wanted to make this into uh, a more realistic uh, app, uh, here are some things we might need to consider or to add to it. So first of all, you saw that the initial loading of our app was pretty slow. It took several seconds. It wasn't great. Uh, so in practice, one thing we would do is partial rendering, which I showed you in the uh, trading systems GUI example, which is just the idea that you only actually really need to render uh, the elements that are currently within your viewport. And for elements that are outside your viewport, you can kind of just cheat and put in just a single empty element of the right size. And as long as you actually make sure it's the right size, otherwise things jump around unexpectedly, this ends up working very nicely and is much more efficient. Uh, another thing you might want to do is uh, to keep certain elements scrolled into your viewport under certain circumstances. And this seems like a very specific thing to want, but I wanted to mention it because it ends up requiring the two functions that we've skipped over. So I wanted to give you a sense of when you might need them. Uh, so if we think back to the uh, TS GUI example, we had this focus that even if we moved it to a row that was currently outside of the viewport, it would just be scrolled back into view. And uh, in order to do this, you need the two functions um, on display and update visibility. Um, so update visibility is called every time your DOM changes or your windows resized or the user scrolls. And this is your chance to make any measurements that you want. Um, for instance, measuring where your focus is relative to the viewport. And you need this in order to know by how much to scroll your page to get it back into view. Uh, now on display is a function that's called every time your DOM changes. And what's special about it is that it allows you to make decisions by comparing your current model to your previous model. So the way this would come in handy is, let's say we only want to scroll our focus back into view. If the current cell that the focus is on is different from uh, the cell it was on in the previous model. So if the user has just moved the cell, we want to keep it scrolled into view. If they're off doing something else completely unrelated to the focus, we want to leave it where it is, because let's say they scroll to the top of the page to write some text in the search box, it would be pretty annoying for them to just forcibly be scrolled back to wherever the focus was. All right, so another thing that we often find ourselves wanting to do uh, in more complex Inker DOM apps is to uh, use incremental computations outside of our view function. So a good example of this is, again, in the TS GUI, uh, where we have uh, this set of rows, and we sort them. And we sort them within an incremental computation, because sorting them every time from scratch would be terribly inefficient. Uh, now, once we throw in a focus, we also want to be able to figure out how to move the focus up by one row or down by one row. So in our apply action function, we actually want to be able to access the list of sorted rows. However, with our current interface, um, if that happens in an incremental computation, it would, happen, it, it would have to happen within our view function. And our apply action function doesn't have access to anything that goes on in there. So we have a problem. And in fact, the API that I've been showing you so far is uh, one of two available interfaces. It's the simple interface. Um, we also have a derived one available that achieves exactly this. It allows you to share incremental computations between various functions, including your apply action and view function. So hopefully now you have an idea of what it looks like to write uh, a simple Inker DOM app and also some considerations uh, when you go from a simple app to a more realistic one. Uh, so if we circle back to in the initial goals that I mentioned, um, we wanted to be able to easily write web UIs. Uh, we wanted for them to be easily maintainable and we wanted to be able to optimize them. So thanks to JS of OCaml, we can achieve uh, the first two, uh, just from the fact that we can now write our apps in OCaml. Also, thanks to the Elm architecture, uh, it provides a very nice pattern that we can follow, a very simple API, and just like a very nice way of thinking about our UIs in general. So that really does make Inker DOM quite easy to use. Um, and thanks to some combination of virtual DOM and incremental and some other techniques that aren't necessarily part uh, of 
the actual Inker DOM library, like partial rendering, uh, we're able to optimize our apps so that even if they use really large amounts of data, they still perform very well. Um, so ever since Inker DOM came into existence, we have been writing a lot more web UIs, and it's really made our lives a lot easier. So hopefully this talk has given you some insight into how Jane Street approaches writing web UIs. All right, so the first question about composability. So there isn't really an explicit concept of components. There will be soon. <laughs> Gene is actually working on that. But um, just based on how the pattern is structured, it's really easy to compose, uh, basically, to have components that follow that structure and to combine them into larger apps that also follow that structure. So it's not as explicit as in React, but it's definitely something that's easy and possible to do. Um, you also asked me about uh, comparing this approach to React and Buckle to React with Reason and Buckle. So, like a messenger, particularly yeah. using Reason React, which is like uh, bindings uh, from uh, Campbell to uh, React, using React as an underlying backend layer, but putting it over in uh, Reason, which is another syntactical example for it. Uh, and so, instead of using it, so Campbell, we use Buckle script as a compiler. Um, and I'm just wondering if, if you had any, if you, if you don't try, if you had any comparisons between the two or approaches or any thoughts there. Okay, so I haven't used any of these uh, languages or, or frameworks, but uh, I guess one nice thing about increment, oh sorry, about Inkerdom is that because you get to build your own incremental app, um, you have a lot of control over the performance of your app. You can really fine tune it. And things like uh, computing the, the total over all of your elements, for instance, you can still do efficiently. And I'm not familiar enough with React to know whether that's possible, but um, I think Inkerdom adds some flexibility for, for certain types of things that you might want to do. Um, and then regarding, yeah, I don't know if you want me to go into Buckle Script, um, but well, okay. So I mean, if if you're curious why why we use JS of Camel instead of Buckle Script, this is what I'm told. I don't know firsthand, but um, I've heard that Buckle Script is harder to maintain, so it ends up being a few versions behind the latest OCaml version, and that's the main reason we aren't able to use it within uh, Jane Street. One really big benefit of it is that it produces actually readable JavaScript which JS of OCaml does not do, but it turns out we just don't really care about that. So <laughs> we're fine with giving that up. Uh, yeah? Uh, yeah, first of all, that's, your talk is very clear and well organized. I don't know if you know anything <laughs> about web development or OCaml, but I thought I understood something. Uh, <laughs> um, can you say something about how Inkerdom compares to Elm. So if, if I were an Elm developer, would I feel comfortable in Can you say something about the um, differences? Um, that's a good question. So, I mean, a lot of the ideas are similar. I think in Elm, you're not forced to use this Elm architecture. It just ends up kind of happening naturally, but it's not enforced upon you. I don't think that's necessarily a disadvantage, because it's nice to just follow this pattern and not have to worry about how to structure your app. Um, as far as the language, I've heard that um, the Elm language is quite similar to OCaml in many ways. Um, beyond that, I just, I guess I, I don't know enough about Elm to get a sense of how easy it is to switch between the two. Um, but there's certainly a lot of shared ideas between them. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. yeah. So in ARM, they also have the concept of command or subscription to model side that um, that model in any way in the input down uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, so in Elm, they also have the concept of command and subscription, which are used to model side effects, um, like making a connection, like, uh, or getting a subscription to somewhere else. So just wondering, is that also modeled in any way? Ah, so, and this happens separately from updates, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so there's a, the Elm, they have two like interfaces. One is just use a model, and the other one is produce a model and also a command, which is could be static. Interesting. So yeah, I'm not really familiar with with like an equivalent system within Anchor DOM. Um, yep. Uh, so the VDOM doesn't really have this uh, analog of like Anchor Map, right? Like whenever you're chain, whenever you're building the VDOM, you can like maybe optimize instructions so that we Mm -hmm. Subtrees, but at the end of the day, you always have to start to do uh, all the all the way up the spine and change it to the one, right? Like here, you always have to do like map that data and always construct that whole list. Yeah. Every time. So, so is it basically just the case that like at some point the V done gets too big and then you'll like there's there's always some sort of max size of that tree and at that point if it gets too big you need to do this um, U uh, what do you call it? Like, the partial like, angle. It's like that basically um, the rule, or can, are there other tricks that you either have or thought about for making the .NET interface itself have like first class of its support for the uh, problem set? So the thing you mentioned that you know every time you have to, if you have a map, you have to call map.data on it and just completely reconstruct that. That's something we have noticed and have been sad about. We haven't really figured out a solution. I mean, you, you do save a lot of work by not actually having to reconstruct the individual individual nodes in the map every time, but yeah, that that's definitely a downside, and yeah, ultimately you do need to use other fancy techniques once your app becomes really really big, like partial rendering. Um, but yeah, I, <laughs> we don't have a solution for that specific problem. Yep. I'm not quite sure anymore, but I thought on one of the slides were there a module state uh, at some yeah. point. Uh, how do you decide what goes into uh, the state or what goes into your model? Uh, in, the, in the demo, I'm, I'm not sure if you used state, state in the end or? Yeah, so I didn't have state in the slides. I kind of ignored it. Um, we had it in the coding demo, and we did leave it empty. So generally, what's important is that, first of all, uh, only our model can be used to generate our view. So anything that we, any information we need in order to actually create our view has to be in the model. And second of all, um, it's important that the model is immutable um, due to various things like how incre incremental works and things like that. So generally, if you have any state that is mutable, such as connections to servers and stuff, you should put those in the state. Yep. Uh, to show that there's a powerful table component, uh, do you have other components like blocks, graph blocks? Um, else, which also allows to do partial updates and so on. That's a great question. So in fact, there's been several UIs that have wanted to use graphs, and it's revealed that we definitely don't have enough tooling around graphs specifically, unfortunately. But that is, that is an area where we probably need to build, build up some components, and I think it would be very useful. No problem. Given that there is uh, some overhead to using incremental computations, uh, when do you find yourself reaching for uh, an incremental model, or when do you think it's fine to just use a you know a plain model that just recompute the whole time? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, so I don't have a definite answer. I think there's some experimentation involved until you become more familiar with the cost of you know the, the overhead cost. But um, you know if you have a small model. Uh, even if you could improve it using incremental, sometimes that hurts more than it helps. So generally when your model uh, is small and isn't really laggy or performing worse than you'd hope without incremental, I guess there is no need to add an incremental. So yeah, that's a very good point. And yeah, there's a lot of fiddling that you need to do sometimes to figure out um, if certain optimizations actually make things worse because of the overhead. 
So what what kind of bugs do you mean exactly? <laughs> I've never seen these bugs you speak of. No, I'm just joking. Um, I mean, we, we've been talking a lot about... Yeah, so we, you can definitely log a lot of information to the console. We've been talking about uh, putting together some testing frameworks. Uh, we That's definitely an area we need to work on. We've considered uh, even just looking at the virtual DOM, turning it, in, turning it into HTML and inspecting that. Um, you can also just test it by running it and seeing if it does what you want. Um, but yeah, I guess we, we could have better tools in place that we have been thinking about but haven't really put together. Um, yeah. So you were entirely talking about the client side. Yeah, that's right. And not at all about the server side or 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 how to you know work on how to simplify communication between the two. I presume that you have tools for that as well. I mean, given that you're you're, you're writing in the same language on both sides, and not in the same uh, in, you're not in the same object code since one side is JS of a camel, and I imagine the other side is is, is natively compiled. Yeah. So. I guess one thing that we have that makes it really easy to talk to the server is we have uh, RPCs over WebSockets. Um, as far as fancier tools than that, we you know, we've put we we have some ideas of like best practices. For instance, we've noticed that um, if you use pipe RPCs that just uh, keep giving you updates regardless of whether the browser browser is able to to process them, you know that causes the browser to crash. So sometimes polling is better is a better alternative, things like that. But um, I guess I'm not too familiar with with other tools that we have. Uh, for my purpose, that has just been sufficient. Uh, yep. Let's say you have a click handler, right, and it generates some requests to the server. And it's kind of a similar question about side effects. And it's going to take a while, right, you have some, say, JavaScript callback, right? Yep. Can you call that inject function from the callback, or how do you handle that situation? Uh, yeah, so um, what you can do is you can schedule an action immediately, and when you, so in your, um, sorry, let me think. Okay, sorry. So um, in your apply action function, you are given this schedule action argument uh, function that you can then use in asynchronous computations to schedule actions later on. So that's fairly easy to handle, and it is something we do a lot. Uh, yeah? Um, whenever you schedule an action, uh, if that process takes a while, the page is still there and it's still to schedule other actions, right? Yeah. So are there any guarantees about how the actions that get applied to the model actually are the actions that got generated by the same model as opposed to actions generated by an older version? Yeah, that's a great question. So you always have this problem if you uh, schedule actions asynchronously that by the time you actually uh, get to your model to apply the action, it might have completely changed from the time you tried to schedule the action. So yeah, that's a problem that you have to deal with. Uh, often you should do checks on your model before applying those actions to make sure the action still makes sense to apply, things like that. But yeah, that's a good point. All right, thank you.